our, uh, our next talk is by, um, by uh, Jan von Grack from Stanford, and he's going to tell us about computing, uh, the, well, about the independence of an ideal computation lesson. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, th thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, so I updated the title a little bit compared to the program. Uh, the initial plan was to talk about um, an older piece of work uh, with Nick Harvey and Piyush Srivastava, and <clears throat> I will still talk about it. It's from uh, about two years ago. And then I will talk a little bit about the very recent update uh, that we did with Piyush here in the last few weeks. So, um, so the topic is the independence polynomial and um, how to compute it and where its roots are. So um, topics related to this workshop. Um, I want to mention two reasons why we care about uh, these questions. Um, the first motivation comes from statistical physics. Um, and the relevant model here is uh, the hardcore model. So this is a model where you have a graph and um, you have some parameters, some um, fugacity parameters um, associated with the vertices. And the possible states in the system are subsets of vertices. It means that you have particles sitting on certain vertices. Uh, and the only uh, configurations which are allowed in this model are independent sets. So the particles are repelling so much that they, they never want to be on two adjacent vertices. That's, uh, that's the hardcore model. Um, and then we have a weight for each configuration. Um, S, we have a weight which is the product of these um, parameters lambda um, over set S. Um, and this gives us a certain distribution over the possible states um, which is described here where the probabilities are proportional to these weights. And we get this normalizing factor, which is the partition function. So this is what appears in statistical physics. And this is the object of uh, great importance, the, the normalizing factor, the summation over all possible states. So uh, as we already heard, um, in the last talk, um, there are several fundamental uh, things that physicists care about. This object, the partition function, in some sense, if you understand uh, the partition function, then you know a lot about the system. Um, you take the logarithm of the partition function, you start differentiating it, uh, you can obtain various macroscopic parameters of the system. And if something strange happens with the log, if you have um, a pole or some discontinuity that this points to something discontinuous happening in your system, some kind of phase transition, all of it. The story is more complicated, as we just heard. But um, certainly, the, the log of the partition function um, is a very important concept. Um, another important concept that we already heard about as well is um, what I will call decay of correlations in this talk. Um, again, it's these long range interactions. Um, namely, the question is it true that if I tell you what is happening somewhere far away, in the system, does it affect significantly what is happening here or not? Do these correlations decay exponentially or how fast do they decay? So um, in the particular model that I mentioned, the Hardcore model, um, it is now quite well understood what is happening for real positive parameters. So when, when the parameter lambda, um, let's say it's the same parameter on each vertex when it's a real positive number, there's a certain critical point where something interesting happens, uh, which is um, essentially de determined by what happens on a large deregular tree. And this critical point lambda c um, has the property that if you are below it, then, then you have decay of correlations for any graph of degree at most t, d, maximum degree at most d. And when you are above this threshold, then uh, there's no decay of correlations, in particular on uh, the infinite deregular tree. Um, so this critical point is also, um, interestingly, related to a computational question, uh, which is whether you can actually compute this partition function or not. Well, you can never compute these functions exactly, but we can hope to compute uh, within some one, pli one plus epsilon error. Um, and again, there's a sharp transition here in terms of whether you can compute this function or not um, at this <coughs> critical point. So this was um, a seminal work of Dror Whites, where he proved that up to this critical point, you can, uh, you can compute partition function 
um, by an algorithm which very much relies on this phenomenon of correlation decay. And above the threshold, um, in the red area here, it becomes NP-hard, which was proved by, um, by Alan Sly and Nike Sun. So, so we have this um, computational phase transition here um, on the positive real axis. What this talk about, uh, this talk is about, is more about the negative regime, and actually more generally the complex regime. So what can we say about um, the negative real axis? Uh, so one thing is that on the negative real axis, you will actually see a root. On the positive real axis, there are no roots because it's a polynomial with positive coefficients. But on the negative real axis, um, there's going to be some root closest to the origin. And this actually happens to be the closest the complex root to the origin, um, which was proved um, by Scott and Sokal, among um, many other things. They studied the Meyer expansion, which is the Taylor expansion of the log, Z, um, from the origin. And you get a, no a lot of nice properties here, uh, namely uh, the log, uh, the Taylor expansion of the log uh, converges in this disk whose radius is determined by the closest negative root. And there's another connection here which is uh, very interesting, which actually led me and Nick Harvey personally to this problem. Uh, initially, I will mention that on the next slide. So the questions that we are interested in here are, uh, where can you compute this polynomial? Where could it possibly have roots? And what about this phenomenon of decay of correlations? What does it actually mean for negative parameters or even for complex um, But the second motivation and the reason that um, we actually came to this um, problem is the Lovas local lemma. And this is a connection which was elucidated in, in this um, beautiful paper by Scott and Sokal. So the Lovas local lemma, maybe many of you have seen it, it's a tool in probabilistic combinatorics, which tells you that if you have a lot of events um, which are not quite independent, but the, the dependencies between them are controlled somehow, that each event depends on at most D other events, then it's enough to assume that the probability of each event is um, something like 1 over D, 1 over E times D plus 1. And that already guarantees that um, the intersection of the complements of these events uh, cannot be empty. So it's possible to avoid all these events, even though you have lots of them. Um, but the bound is almost as if you had just D events. You just applied the union bound. You would need to assume that the probabilities are bounded by 1 over N. But this tells you it's enough to assume that the probabilities are at most 1 over E times the dependency degree. So that's um, it's a beautiful tool in, um, in combinatorics. Um, note that there's a uh, bound here which only says that the probability is strictly positive. It doesn't tell you how large the probability might be. And in, indeed, it might be very small. So this leads to this whole area of how you actually find config configurations that um, satisfy this bound. But I will not talk about that here. Um, what I want to talk about is the connection to the independence polynomial. Um, so, so here's a slightly more general setup. You have some graph. Let's call it a dependency graph. And the vertices represent the events. And the edges represent the dependencies, um, pairwise um, dependencies. And the property that we want to assume here is that each event is mutually independent of all the events which are non-neighbors in this graph. So whatever conditioning you put on the events that are non-neighbors, it should not affect um, this particular event, or it could actually affect it, but only in a positive direction. So uh, here's a slightly more general version of the Lovas local lemma. If you have a dependency graph, and if you can put variables on the vertices such that this condition is satisfied, then again, you have the same conclusion that the probability of the, the intersection of the complements is non-empty. And you have some quantitative bound here, which, however, could be exponentially small. Um, so this is, the, this is the version of the last local lemma that is usually taught, or you have probably seen that somewhere. But there's another even more general version, which is um, Shearer's lemma, which is less known. And the reason is that it's not so easy to apply. But the beauty of this lemma is that it's an if and only if statement. So this is the optimal form of the Lovas local lemma. 
And Shear's lemma tells you that if you have a dependency graph with given probabilities on the events, then the conclusion of the Lovas local lemma is true, namely it's possible to avoid all the events for any configuration of events consistent with this dependency graph. That's the case if and only if the dependence polynomial is positive when you plug in the probabilities with negative signs. And more, moreover, it should be true that it's positive on some path connecting the origin. I just chose a simple path here uh, from the origin to my point P, which is just the line segment. So that looks quite strange at first. Uh, the, the minus signs are related to some inclusion exclusion going on. So it actually makes much more sense when you think about it um, more. Um, but the beautiful thing here is that the negative root that I talked about earlier, the, the root closest to the origin, that's exactly the, the limit of applicability of the Lovas local lemma. If you, if you fix the depend dependency graph and you ask, how much can I push the probabilities on these events? before the local lemma stops being true, that's given exactly by this, uh, by this closest negative root. So the questions that are motivated by this connection are, are the following. One is, um, can you actually determine what this threshold is, at least approximately? Probably, we're not going to do that exactly, but if I give you a dependency graph, do we, can we actually figure out what is the optimal probability that we, want to, that we can put on the events at bound for which the local MI is still true? How can we figure out what that optimal bound is? Um, the other point that I actually did not mention, which is also nice, is that the value of this polynomial, when I plug in these negative probabilities, that's exactly the optimal lower bound on the probability of avoiding all these events. Um, and some kind of extremal instance. So this is actually the best lower bound. So compu computing this value means computing a lower bound, the best possible lower bound on avoiding all these bad events. In applications, these are usually something bad that you want to avoid. So that would be also nice if we could compute this number. Um, the last question is the question of actually finding a configuration which avoids all the events. And that's, that's the question of um, an algorithmic Lovas local lemma, which I will not talk about here, but as you have probably heard, uh, that's a very interesting problem with some beautiful work. Um, oh, and in statistical physics, actually people have also tried to compute this negative root. So I don't know exactly what the physical significance of the negative root is. Maybe somebody here can tell me more, but people have tried to compute it. For example, for the planar lattice, it's some number, this is some very accurate estimate of the number computed by, I believe, the, the um, <coughs> transfer matrix method. Um, but th this is exactly the number that we, we are asking. Can, can we compute this number in general? Okay. So, um, so here's our first result, and this is the work from two to three uh, years ago. Oops. So, okay, so this result says that as long as you are not too close to this negative root, you can compute uh, the partition function, um, which means you can compute this lower bound on the probability of avoiding uh, all the bad events and so on. And the way we do, is, uh, do this is essentially by applying um, the correlation decay algorithm of drawer whites, which I will describe. Um, and um, the algorithm is pretty much exactly the same. The analysis is different for several reasons, which I will talk about. But I want to say that this result can be also obtained by a different method, which has been discussed here in this program quite a lot, which is um, the polynomial extrapolation method um, um, suggested by Barbinock. And this particular result was done by uh, Patel and Rechts. Uh, which relies on basically looking at the logarithm of z and uh, ex extrapolating from the origin uh, using the fact that you can compute derivatives, uh, some low degree derivatives at the origin. <clears throat> one difference, uh, well, I want to compare the two methods a little bit in this talk. One difference is that um, 
difference, the difference between 16 and 17. So in 16, we had a result where we had delta here. In uh, 2017, we improved, it, improved this to square root delta. OK, maybe not a huge improvement. Um, this was relevant to an application that I mentioned, which is can we actually estimate where the nearest root is? So this result is about computing the values of the polynomial. right? And if you can compute the values, we can also compute derivatives. So we can use um, Newton's method, essentially, to estimate where the negative root is. Um, but we get some blow up there in the exponent. We actually get square root n. So this square root delta leads to a square root n. But if we had delta here, we would get exponential in n, which is actually trivial. So the square root allows us to get at least something non-trivial, but um, we are not very happy with that result. I will talk a little bit, a little bit on the next slide. Um, in terms of the picture in the complex plane, this was the picture um, two years ago. So now there are some updates. But two years ago, uh, what did we know? We knew that on the real axis, there's this critical point, lambda c, up to which you can compute. You have, you have an FT task. Um, um, above that, it's hard. And then we have this disk, which is determined by uh, the nearest negative root. And also Galanis, Goldberg, and Stepankovic prove that below that a negative root, um, it's, it's hard to compute the partition function. Um, the question of uh, estimating where the negative root is, as I mentioned, that's related to uh, checking membership, well, checking membership in something we call Shearer's region here. What this means is uh, exactly checking whether the condition of Ch uh, Shearer's lemma is satisfied or not. So if I give you these probabilities, I give you a graph, uh, how well can you check whether Shearer's lemma actually applies or not? So it applies in this region described here, which uh, we call Shearer's region. And what can we do about this question? Well, it's relatively weak what we can do. But actually, I, I want to pose it here as a, uh, as a question. Can you do better using some of these other methods? So what we can do is we can um, essentially estimate the nearest negative root within a relative error of delta. In running time, which is exponential in um, the worst thing is this, square root n over delta. So it's exponential in square root n. It's at least something non-trivial, but uh, pretty bad. Um, and as I mentioned, the square root n comes from this square root delta improvement that we were uh, able to achieve. So now let me um, return to the complex plane. So what do we know about um, the roots? Uh, let me say a few words about this alternative technology that uh, Sasha Barbinok um, developed, and it has been pretty successful here. So the, the philosophy, uh, let me call it Barbinox philosophy, if he doesn't mind, uh, <laughs> is that uh, pretty much everything is determined by where the roots are. So if you can, if you can get uh, from the origin to some place in the complex plane, uh, with some a reasonable region which is not too thin, avoiding roots, um, then you can also compute the value there. So if you can get there while avoiding roots, then you're fine. That's the philosophy. And it's also true in, a technical, in some technical sense. Um, so um, the first application of this is that you know, we already knew from Scott and Sokal that in this disk, there are no roots. So that implies that you can compute uh, the in uh, independence polynomial in this disk. The exact parameters might be, you know, uh, up to further analysis. Uh, for example, there's this question of square root delta versus delta. But if you ignore such details, then basically the fact that you are root free in this disk just tells you everything. Um, but then, OK, there was this other phenomenon that was known, which is that th this critical point means that we can compute on the real axis up to this point and not above. Now. Um, there's no root on the positive real axis. So it was a little bit mysterious where this phenomenon comes from. But this was um, essentially explained by uh, Peters and Recht in 2017. 
who proved, number one, they proved that um, there's some thin rectangle, not too thin, but just some rectangle around the positive real axis between the origin and the critical point, almost up to the critical point, where you don't have any roots. So that's another explanation for why you can actually compute the partition function up to this point. Because if you have a region like this, then you can use Barbinox technology and you can transform this to some disk or you can maybe you can do it in different ways. You can inch your way towards this point by composing a sequence of disks or you can do some extrapolation method to get almost up to this point and compute the value there. So that's, that's the philosophy. I hope I, um, I said it correctly. And not only that, they show that there's a barrier. Um, the barrier is this uh, red curve here which uh, can be nicely described. And the meaning of the red barrier is that there could be roots arbitrarily close to this red curve. Um, and in fact, the red curve is determined by what happens on large deregular trees. So um, for deregular trees, they <coughs> prove that things are very nice. Inside this red curve, um, there are no roots. You can compute the polynomial. Uh, there's even correlation decay. But uh, outside this curve, there might be roots. Anywhere on the curve, you could have a root arbitrarily close to it. And in a remarkable follow-up work, Bezakova, um, Galanis, Goldberg, and Stefankovic showed that indeed it's actually hard to compute the polynomial outside of this curve. And we will hear about this in the next talk. So, the, so this was a pretty compelling picture by the way, the infinite deregular tree was so far the worst case uh, in some sense in both scenarios. On the positive real axis, um, this critical point is determined by what happens on the, the deregular tree. The, the negative root is also determined by what happens on, uh, on a deregular tree. So, so maybe this was the right answer, right? Maybe this curve um, is actually the, correct separation between easy and hard. Um, another update was uh, Bench and Chikvari um, show that there's this slightly bigger, quite a bit bigger region where there are no roots. So uh, blue means no roots. Red means there might be roots. But very recently, um, Boyce, who is also here, show that actually there could be roots inside the inside this heart-shaped region. So that's maybe a little bit disappointing. This nice conjecture cannot be true. And the examples that he found are, are still trees, but um, not regular. The, the degrees vary in a certain way as you go uh, down the levels. You, you vary the degrees in a certain clever way. You can produce these new roots. So, um, okay, so the conjecture was not true. So now what is the correct region? Uh, so the latest update is that we have some region we have some new region where there are no roots. Um, I will tell you, um, but we don't have a very nice explicit formula for it, but I'll show you the statement. There's some region that we can uh, basically check numerically what, uh, which points are in it and which are not. One thing we know for sure is that it connects nicely to the bench Chikvari region. And the point, by the way, I should say the picture is kind of, uh, limiting picture for large but fixed D. So when I say pi over 2D, it means that um, for each D you get some picture, but in the limit, this is roughly pi over 2D. Uh, so we get the same point. It connects to their region, and it also touches the, this uh, heart-shaped curve uh, quite nicely. We believe, and that's something we can actually prove, I think I want to claim, that can prove it has the right behavior near the negative root. So when you look at the behavior of the curve close to the negative root, the imaginary part is a certain part of the real part when you, when you shift it. Um, imagine that this is the origin. Uh, the imaginary part is like the real part to a power of 1.5. So we, we get actually the correct power. So, so around here, it's pretty tight. But as you move out, there's a certain gap. And we know that the gap must be there because there are some roots even here in this wedge between the green area and the, the red curve. So I don't want to claim, and this is the very recent work with Piyush that we uh, literally in the last two weeks. So um, 
I don't want to conjecture that this is the correct region. I think we should be careful now, but at least it's some nice region. Uh, all right, so I want to say a little bit about uh, the techniques. There are two parts here, so I will try to split the time. Um, let me talk a little bit about this older work. Um, some of you might have seen it, but there are some points I want to uh, make. So um, any question about the results? Any question about this picture? Uh, you got a and, curve I, on there? Do you, what's the curve for the green? What's the curve? So I don't, yeah, we don't have a, a closed formula for the curve. I will tell you, I'll state a theorem. I'll state a theorem which uh, tells you what the curve is, but we don't have a nice formula. Yeah, it's. Um, is it smooth when the two curves? Oh, so, uh, so actually I drew it, uh, by the way, this is a sketch. This is not an exact plot. Uh, I drew it as if the derivative here is the same, but I'm not sure if we know that. We don't, uh, we, we don't want to claim that, yeah. Um, it's, it's the same value at least, but not sure about the derivative. Yeah, yeah. any other questions about the picture? So let me talk a little bit about this um, work from two years ago. So what was the point there? So it's, it's a correlation decay algorithm, which by now has been used quite a lot. Um, um, we are certainly not the first ones to use it. Um, the new, um, okay, there are a few new aspects here. One is that we have um, multivariate polynomial here. So, so this is a polynomial where you have a different value sitting on each vertex. That was actually the main difficulty. Um, the question of what we could possibly ex ex uh, expect here in the exponent um, is very much relevant to the application that I mentioned, which is how well can you estimate the negative root. Um, unfortunately, for this method, we know that square root delta is the best we can do here. So that happens. Um, uh, sorry, um, this one over square root delta um, is basically what happens on the, the regular tree. If you look at the recurrence and see what happens in the negative regime, it converges uh, with a rate which corresponds to this one over square root delta. So that's the best, we, we cannot improve that. Um, how we analyze the, the correlation decay algorithm is, um, is a little bit new. So let me recap very quickly how this algorithm works. And um, this, is, uh, this is the work of Dror Weitz, where he did it in the positive regime. Um, you write down the partition function as a telescoping product of these ratios. The ratios can be interpreted as uh, ratios of certain probabilities. Basically, for a certain subset of vertices, a certain induced subgraph, you look at the distribution of um, independent sets, and you look at the probability that this vertex appears versus the probability that it doesn't appear. And the ratio gives you something we call R sub SU. And if we can compute these numbers, then we can compute everything. So let's focus on computing these ratios. Now these ratios satisfy a nice uh, recurrence formula, which is that um, for any vertex U, um, and when my current subset is S, I can look at the neighbors of u, and I can peel them off one by one, and I get this product. I get lambda, which is the parameter here, at u times the product of one over one plus the ratios corresponding to its children. So if we could unroll this um, up to the, down to the leaves, then we would compute exactly these ratios, but obviously that would, the tree would be too large. So, so the idea here is to cut off the tree. Just chop it off at some level and hope that it doesn't mess up the computations too much. And um, the question whether this will affect the computation of the root too much is exactly the question whether you have decay of correlations or not for these quantities. So White's great contribution was that he showed that you actually have decay of cor correlations in this computation. Uh, the errors will just disappear if you choose the depth to be sufficiently large, like it's enough to take logarithmic. Um, and he showed that that's true up to the critical point, which was already known or conjectured to be the right answer. So, uh, so we want to do the same thing in the negative regime. Actually, the fact that we have negative parameters 
it's not such a big deal. It doesn't change things too much. Um, what is new here is that parameters are non-uniform. So, um, so the difficulty here is that we have a recurrence, which looks exactly the same. I just flipped the sign here because of the negative regime. And, um, and we have a certain uh, parameter. Now I call it PU because it corresponds to the probabilities that I talked about earlier. This PU is some parameter uh, sitting on each vertex. And I don't have any uniform bound on these PUs. They could be some probabilities. And I only know that globally they satisfy this property that um, the point that we are evaluating is not too close to the negative root. Okay, so it's like some, it's some global, uh, global property. But we cannot say anymore that as we perform the computation and we go up one level, let's say, we cannot prove that the errors will decay by some factor every time. They could actually blow up and then decay again and blow up, depending on the structure of the graph and the, the structure of these parameters. So we need some more, more flexible notion of what it means to have decay of correlations. And this more flexible notion, ah, yeah, but this is what I just mentioned, um, this new notion is that we define a certain yardstick for each vertex in the graph, or in the, in the computation tree, rather. We define a certain parameter that we want to compare ourselves to. And that's, uh, that's this quantity beta. So imagine that I can define certain parameters beta such that I can prove that the, the true values differ from the values that I estimate by something that decays relative to these betas. These betas should also be somehow reasonably behaved in the sense that they don't blow up. If, if these betas blow up, then this doesn't mean anything. But let's say I can define the betas uh, in a reasonable way and get a guarantee relative to, to them. Uh, so the question is, what should this beta be? And it happens that there's a pretty nice way to define it, which works very, very well. And the way you can define the betas is that you just take a derivative essentially a directional derivative of the parameter that we want to estimate, the RSU, on a line that connects the origin to that. Imagine you draw a line from the origin through that point, and you move along that line and take the derivative when you are at the point P. This is a directional derivative. And that's my parameter. So I claim that this is somehow the right notion. And why is it the right notion? I think this might be applicable more generally, because something that happens here is pretty generic. Uh, what happens is that we have a certain recurrence, right? Uh, the recurrence, um, let me go back a little bit. The recurrence was here. This is a recurrence. We compute recursively these values, and then we want to compute this one. So the question is, how do the errors in these guys propagate to an error in this one? Well, if the errors are infinitesimal, we can, uh, we can do an engineering approximation. We can say that the errors propagate like this. We take the total differential by the chain rule, you get this formula. And this formula is very different to taking this directional derivative. Actually, there's one difference, which is this 1 plus. But apart from that, it's exactly the same formula. The 1 plus comes from differentiating the, um, this PU in front itself. But let's ignore that. It's exactly the same formula. And there's a generic reason behind <coughs> it, the chain rule. How do, you, how do you differentiate a function of multiple variables? Uh, you differentiate it like this. So, so this tells me that if things were infinitesimal, if the, the errors were infinitesimal, then they would propagate exactly according to these betas. So th this is the correct definition of how errors propagate in this computation. So then all we need to do is to analyze these betas and say that they are themselves not too large. So that requires more work, but uh, I will skip it. I'll skip the details. This is basically the, the technique of analyzing correlation decay in this multivariate setting, which was, I think it's new. I wanted to uh, mention that technical point. Okay, uh, any questions about this? Or uh, I will move on to the last part, which is the new part. Yes, yes. Good question. No, so we don't know that. And we, we certainly didn't have time to explore it, but it's a good question. One, one point. So the green region, which I will turn to now, is all about the single variable regime. So there are two regimes here, univariate and multivariate. Uh, 
to be fair, I should also say a bit about your technique, the uh, polynomial extrapolation technique. Seems to be able to handle um, multiple variables, which means non-uniform non assignments somehow for free, right? Because you take uh, univariate restriction along the line through that point, and somehow it just works for free, while here we have to work quite a bit to make it work. So, so that's another advantage of your technique. I think the only advantage that we uh, still have is the square root delta, <laughs> so, so the last surviving, unless, unless Sasha can do it now. Just wait but, for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But still, yeah, the two techniques are kind of related, but still not quite. So that's something interesting too. But you here compute also contraction in L infinity norm. It's like in Gamarning at all. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. yeah. Well, but in our setting, it's a little bit more involved. So as I said, it's a contraction under, there, there are different ways that people do this. Either they, um, they map, they have some <coughs> map which will transform the complex plane in a way that will make your recurrence a contraction. What we are doing here is a little bit different. It's, we define these betas, maybe you can interpret it that way too, but I'm not sure. But the main point is that this is a multivariate setting which is quite different from all these other papers. I think those are all univariate. No, Gamarnik, uh, that it's multivariate. Multivariate for uh, matching yeah. polynomial? It's yeah. for match. Yeah, yeah. Matching, and it's... Uh, low free, yeah. low free, right? Yeah. It's multivariate? Yeah, the, the but it's too <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, still to my actual question I was going to ask was, are you suggesting this could extend to, say, coloring? Ah, yeah. so let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I have five minutes, I guess. Um, five. Five minutes. Five. Five minutes for uh, this new, um, this latest piece of work. Um, so okay, this is. Uh, I can formulate a theorem, uh, which you might find satisfying or not. So this is the condition that we have. So we were interested in what happens in the regime of complex parameters, and now back to univariate z of lambda, just one complex parameter, and the real part of lambda is negative. So we are in the left half plane. What happens there? So, so this is what we can do. Take some lambda in this, in this region and generate a certain curve. The curve uh, is generated in segments. The first segment is just a line segment. So you draw uh, from the origin to lambda, a linear segment. And then we apply repeatedly this, um, this recurrence, which, um, which appears every time there's some paper on uh, roots of the <laughs> independence polynomial, this comes up. This is uh, always relevant. Uh, so now we apply it to the previous segment of the curve, and we map the previous segment of the per uh, curve under this map. Um, and we continue doing that. The statement is that if this curve is contained in the upper half plane, then lambda cannot be a root. That's a theorem. Uh, you could ask how effective is this or how can we check anything using this property. Um, the thing is that you don't have to generate the curve all the way to uh, infinity. Uh, I'm including um, one example of um, what happens here. So the, the heart-shaped curve is what we saw before. That's the, the red curve. The, the, cardioid, it's not quite a cardioid. That's the same curve as before. This curve is the G of T curve that I described. So it starts with a linear segment. Sorry, it's a pretty ugly picture. Um, and you generate it, this is like four or five segments that you need to generate before you see that you didn't enter uh, the negative, uh, the lower half plane. And in fact, the argument of Z as you move along the curve started um, already increasing. So actually you can say, at this point, you can say safely that this curve will be trapped in its own orbit and it will never generate anything that's outside of the convex hull, what we have seen so far. So this is how you can check that things are fine. Uh, so this is one example of a lambda for which we can say, okay, there's no root. Uh, there cannot be a root at lambda because the curve behaves like this. So why can we, why can we say that? Um, <coughs> The, the important point here is the, the, the interplay between multivariate and univariate, again. So in general, we should worry about the multivariate recurrence. 
we should worry about what happens when we take some, um, some values z1 through zd z minus 1, and we apply this recurrence. This is exactly the same recurrence that we saw in, the, in White's algorithm and in our algorithm as well. Uh, a lemma which is pretty easy to prove, which was used before, is that uh, if this is a root for a certain graph of degree at most t, it means that it's possible to generate minus 1 using this recurrence. And if, if you apply it one more time, then this, this is divided by 0. So something bad happened there. Uh, but uh, if it's not possible to generate minus 1, then it means that this cannot be a root. This is if and only. And uh, usually the difficulty in analyzing this is that you have to deal with multiple variables. You have to keep track of what, uh, maybe you want to find some region of the values zi that could be possibly generated by this recurrence. And if you can show that that's bounded away from minus 1, then you know that you are safe. You're fine. Um, so one thing we do here is that we actually consider slightly more general recurrence, where you are allowed to put fractional powers here. It makes things more smooth. So let's allow to have more than d um, parameters, but we always raise them to powers that add up to at most d minus 1. Let's just allow that. One thing that this implies is that if you can generate z1 and z2, then you can also generate any uh, geometric convex combination, if I can call it that. z1 to the alpha times z2 to the <coughs> 1 minus alpha. Uh, so this makes the arguments somehow more smooth. Um, here's one um, elementary lemma that we had to prove. Probably it should have a simple proof, but we, we didn't know. Uh, we don't know it. So uh, any, anybody who knows a trivial proof of this, tell me after the talk. For any two points in the complex plane, when I connect them by the curve of these geometric averages, uh, it's sort of concave in the sense that uh, the convex combinations between these two points are always below the curve. That's the claim. Anyway, this is useful in our analysis, and I should wrap up soon, so let me skip that. Uh, the point here is, uh, roughly speaking, that in this multivariate recurrence, we can always reduce things to a single parameter, uh, which in some sense dominates what we could generate by using multiple parameters. And it relies exactly on this, uh, this geometric lemma that I just described. The claim is that whatever you can generate by using this multivariate recurrence, you can also generate by this <coughs> univariate recurrence, where z tilde is something in the convex hull of these guys. So you can always replace things by points in the convex hull. Uh, and uh, you can always generate something with the same argument and modulus, which is at least as large. And that's what you need to track. What is the maximum possible modulus that you can produce for a given angle? Once you have that property, we can prove this, that if the curve that I described is a, contained in the upper half plane, then um, this cannot be a root. And it all relies on the fact that we were able to reduce things to this univariate case. So, so we can check for different points whether they could be roots or not. We can do some analytic computations, but uh, one thing I, uh, okay, I believe it's correct, but this is very fresh. So let me state it. I believe that we have the same power law near the negative root, which is given by the cardioid root, which is uh, the imaginary part is roughly the real part to the power of 1.5. Um, OK, so let me finish with a few open questions. I mentioned some of them already, I think. So is there any way to compute the independence polynomial with a better dependence on delta, which is the distance from the nearest root? So it's pretty bad. It's 1 over square root delta in the exponent. And that essentially kills all the applications that we originally were hoping for, like some algorithm for the Lobos local lemma that basically failed because of this reason. Um, Yes, and a similar question for estimating where the negative root is. Um, yeah, the question that some other people here are also thinking about is what, what is the maximal root-free region? The question of the picture that I showed, what is the right picture? And one more question I want to mention, which I don't know if it makes sense to <coughs> physicists, but uh, the shear region in the negative regime is a multivariate region, and it has some nice description and a nice interpretation. So is there actually a meaningful multivariate region for positive uh, lambda? 
like like the whites threshold, but but you have um, different lambdas on different vertices. Is there some nice region where you can compute z in the positive real regime uh, in the multivariate sense? Or does it mean anything? Um, okay, so I, that's all. Thank you. So I have actually kind of philosophical question. Uh, is there any relationship between all this stuff, including, by the way, that interpolational method and method of transfer functions? Can I kind of prune matrices in the transfer function, make them smaller based on their contraction properties, and to get a, to get to, you know? Because the reason why I'm asking is when I'm listening to this. The people who are interested about roots of polynomials, of multivariate, so we know physicists, we know this community, but it's also, there is also control theory community, yeah. they, which talk with so-called d-dimensional systems. And I look at the things which you do, it's, it kind of reminds me with what, uh, but anyway, is the, the philosophical question, can you, can you also prune transfer function method based on the spectral properties of matrices there, and is there a connection between I have no idea. Yeah. This, so this uh, the world of the independence polynomial is not not very spectral. Like we don't talk about you know there's no matrices and eigenvalues here. Um, um, there's a connection possibly uh, to the Cadison Singer world that we were at some point hoping to find, and that's um, also not clear. Uh, um, so that that's the spectral world, right? I, I don't know. This is a little bit different. I don't have any good answer. Oh, oh it's, it's another philosophical question. Um, uh, so you mentioned White's algorithm, or White's, White's uh, approach, but you mentioned it only in the context of decay of correlation. White's also had uh, this very nice algorithm for, right, for, for computing partition function. Is there any connection between uh, his algorithm and not use of it for decay of correlation and uh, business of polynomials? But this algorithm is uh, exactly what I described, right? Is that what? Well, well or, 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 construction of mm. this self-avoiding tree. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so let's. Itself is, uh, is kind of very, very unusual. And, uh, uh, yeah, let me say a little bit. So the way um, Drawer describes things is a little bit different. He talks about this self-avoiding walk tree, and he compares what happens on an arbitrary graph versus this tree. So. This is a slightly different point of view, which is actually equivalent. So uh, um, I prefer not to think about self-avoiding walks. I think it's easier, like if you look at this, um, at least in the regime that we are worried about. Uh, this recurrence here, uh, in some sense, these are exactly the self-avoiding walks. If you track, uh, you start with some subset, you go to a child, you always have to peel off the, the parent. So the branches in this tree, you can interpret them exactly as self-avoiding uh, walks. It's just a slightly different notation, but it's actually exactly the same tree that he talks about. Uh, it just uses slightly different notation, but it's exactly the same thing. And we analyze things directly on this computation tree. We don't, um, yeah, I think, um, it's just a matter of how, how you view it. It's not well, really fundamentally Well, the fact that the self-avoiding tree is very uneven, right? Mm -hmm. So there are maybe very long branches. Mm -hmm. How does it reflect itself in, uh, in the structure of polynomials? Um, so is your question how, uh, how that affects the computation of the tree? Or um, the question that we are uh, interested in is how the errors propagate on this tree. And that's also the question that Drawer uh, White cares about. It's exactly the same question, yeah. I'm not sure, maybe we can talk offline, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good question. 
So we have a <coughs> slightly longer break uh, where we convene at 11.45. Thanks. Thanks.